Tumitilaok na ang manok Hudyat na ng pagpasok Paglilingkod na walang kapalit Sa bayan ng aming hati Tara na, kaibigan Huwag kang magpaiwan Gamitin ang dunong bansa'y susulo Ating abutin ang pangarap ni Juan Sa pamamagitan ng agham Ang kaunlaran ay makakamtan Kung lahat magtutulungan Tara na, sama-sama Itaguyod ang siyensya Maayos na bukas para sa Pilipinas Sa pamamagitan na ang nagham, ang kaunlaran ay makakamtan kung lahat magtutulungan. Tara na, sama-sama, itaguyod ang siyensya, maayos na bukas para sa Pilipinas. Tingabutin ang pangarap ni Juan Sa pamamagitan na ang nagham Ang kaunlaran ay makakamtan Kung lahat magtutulungan Tara na, sama-sama Itaguyod ang siyensya Maayos na bukas para sa Pilipinas Pangarap kong magkaroon ng Chief Alternative for Personal Hygiene. Pangarap kong magkaroon ng mabilis at murang transportasyon para sa lahat. Pangarap kong masagot ang malnutrition. Pangarap ko pong magkaroon ng effective communication means for emergency. Pangarap kong ma-maximize yung renewable energy source and to reduce the carbon dioxide emission. Pangarap ko pong maging Ganda o simula na, humanda sabay-sabay at hawak kamay tayo'y ang ating lipad, lipad. The 
Tumitilaot na ang manok Hudyat na ng pagpasok Paglilingkod na walang kapalit Sa bayan ng aming hati Tara na, kaibigan Huwag kang magpaiwan Gamitin ang dunong bansa'y susulo Mahirap man ay kakayanin Sa pinagsamang lakas at galing Tagumpay ay mararating Tara na kaibigan Huwag kang magpaiwan Gamitin ang dunong bansa ay susuro At ikabutin ang pangarap iwan Sa pamamagitan na Ngabutin ang pangarap iwan Sa pamamagitan ng magham Ang kaunlaran ay makakamtan Kung lahat magtutulungan Tara na, sama-sama Itaguyod ang siyensya Maayos na bukas para sa Pilipinas Pangarap kong magkaroon ng mabilis at murang transportasyon para sa lahat. Pangarap kong masagot ang malnutrition. Pangarap ko pong magkaroon ng effective communication means for emergency. Pangarap kong ma-maximize yung renewable energy source and to reduce the carbon dioxide emission. Pangarap ko pong maging scientist. Ayun na o simula na Humanda sabay-sabay akyat Hawak kamay tayo'y ang ating lipat Lipat Ating nabutin ang pangarap iwan Sa pamamagitan ng aghag Ang kaunlaran ay makagamtan Kung lahat magtutulungan
Tumitilaok na ang manok Hudyat na ng pagpasok Paglilingkod na walang kapalit Sa bayan ng aming hati Tara na, kaibigan Huwag kang magpaiwan Gamitin ang dunong bansa'y susulo Ating abutin ang pangarap liwan Sa pamamagin Mahirap man ay kakayanin Sa pinagsamang lakas at galing Tagumpay ay mararating Tara na kaibigan Huwag kang magpaiwan Gamitin ang dunong bansa ay susulo At ikabutin ang pangarap iwan Sa pamamagitan na Sa pamamagitan na maghang Ang kaunlaran ay makakamtan Kung lahat magtutulungan Tara na, sama-sama Itaguyod ang siyensya Maayos na bukas para sa Pilipinas Ang pangarap ko ay maging piloto Pangarap ko magkaroon ng chief alternative for personal hygiene. Pangarap kong magkaroon ng mabilis at murang transportasyon para sa lahat. Pangarap kong masagot ang malnutrition. Pangarap ko pong magkaroon ng effective communication means for emergency. Pangarap kong ma-maximize yung renewable energy source and to reduce the carbon dioxide emission. Pangarap ko pong maging Simula na, humanda sabay-sabay akyat, hawak kamay tayo'y ang aking lipat, lipat. Good afternoon to our Zoom participants, to our Facebook participants, and um, our participants in YouTube as well. Welcome to our webinar on bioethics on the use of animals for research. I am Megat Yenza, and I will be moderating this afternoon's learning session. Uh, just a few reminders, most especially to our Zoom participants, kindly rename your Zoom account to the prescribed format your office name underscore your full name. So for example, I am from the OSTITBI. I will put the OSTITBI underscore Meg Atienza. 
Okay, so I am seeing a lot of very excited learners this more this afternoon, and we are almost um, 300 in Zoom. And on via Facebook, I can see that we are almost 50 participants. So if you have colleagues who registered for this webinar this afternoon, kindly tell them that we are about to begin our learning session. And uh, this two-day webinar marks the beginning of the Virology and Vaccine Institute of the Philippines or the VVIP's Information Recording and in Education progress. Campaign on Virology and other related topics. This learning session is made possible by the collaborative efforts of DOST Central Office, DOST ITDI, DOST PCHRD, DOST Picard, and the DOST Balik Scientist Program. So again, welcome to our learners. I can see that we have a lot of participants all the way from Zambales, uh, Osami City, Cebu, Bataan. Wow, so everybody is here with us this afternoon. All excited to learn about the bioethics on the use of animals for research and proper, anim proper animal handling. But before we begin our lecture, let us first watch a video for us to know more about the in this new institute under the Department of Science and Technology. Please watch this. We are now living in a new normal. This COVID-19 pandemic marks as one of the global challenges experienced in this generation. It forces every sector of our society to innovate in order to move forward. We at the Industrial Technology Development Institute of the Department of Science and Technology is trying every possible ways to continue our service to our people without compromising the safety of each and everyone.
recognizing the critical role of science and technology in economic development and progress. The Balik Scientist Act or Republic Act 11035 was signed into law last June 2018 by President Rodrigo Roa Duterte. This is actually uh, putting into law a program that uh, has been started by the Department of Science and Technology almost uh, 40 years ago. Uh, but uh, we need uh, some uh, legal support so that we can implement it in a uh, better way. The Malik scientists will have an uh, easier time in terms of uh, coming here to the Philippines and rendering services. Who is the Balik scientist? experience and expertise of uh, uh, Filipinos uh, who have made good uh, practice of uh, being scientists abroad so that we can uh, they can share whatever they have uh, in terms of knowledge uh, and wisdom to uh, our own institutions, uh, our own uh, researchers. My role and responsibility of a public scientist is to be not just a teacher or a facilitator but also a pusher innovations within the program. Balik scientists are given support by the government for their stay in the country and are likewise provided with a wide array of benefits to ensure their maximum output. The best incentives or privileges or benefits are having to be exposed with our farmers. My greatest privilege would be uh, doing collaborative work with uh, fellow Filipinos. The DOST, as the leading agency in charge of the Balik Scientist Program, is tasked to facilitate the placement of the Balik Scientist among its priority areas from its sub-agencies. P-Card PCHRD P-Shared Partnering with the DOST are the host institutions, private or public entities, providing the appropriate resources to the Balik scientist in the completion of their research activities and other tasks. I think the role of the institution is to give the space or the laboratory needed for the program or the project. Working together, the DOST, the Balik scientists, and the host institutions have proven the importance of collaboration and cooperation, critical of any nation's vision for success. I am an advocate of Balik Scientist Program. Okay, being one, I really truly felt that uh, Balik Scientist would be able to help in uplifting the economic growth of, of, of the country. My hopes is to really contribute to uh, the space agency. It's a very, very pragmatic and uh, we will need everybody's help and also promulgate the STEM program here in the Philippines. We really need to encourage other Balik scientists or other scientists abroad to uh, give their time. They need to give back and uh, help the country. With the enactment of the Balik Scientist Act, the country is looking towards a stronger and more solid Science and Technology Foundation, propelling the nation to further heights. Change has come indeed for science and technology. Science for change. Science for the people. All right, that was our video about the virology and the Vaccine Institute of the Philippines as well as a briefer about the DOST Balik Scientist Program. So thank you very much uh, for DOST-ITDI 
before preparing that video to our participants. And again, may mga nagtatanong po dito if uh, you will receive a certificate. So lahat po ng ating participants sa Zoom, sa Facebook Live, and sa YouTube will receive uh, certificates as long as you answer our evaluation form tomorrow. So mag lang po tayo ng evaluation form that will be shown tomorrow at sagutan po natin yun to ensure our certificates for this learning session. Thank you very much. And just a participant check, we are now uh, 300, we have now have 300 participants via Zoom. And sa Facebook po, uh, meron na tayong almost 86 participants. And ayan nga po, dahil na na-orient na kayo kung ano po ba ang VVIP and DOST Balik Scientist Program. Bago po tayo pagsimula sa ating lecture, may I please call on the Director of the Industrial Technology Development Institute to formally welcome our speaker and of course our participants. Good afternoon, Dr. Briones. Uh, thank you, Meg. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Our distinguished speaker, uh, Balik Scientist, Dr. Myra P. Husmilio, my ITDI family, DOST officials, colleagues, participants, guests, my warmest greetings to all of you. The project on the virology is on the establishment of the Virology and Vaccine Institute of the Philippines, or VIP, as we commonly call, was conceptualized to address the pandemic readiness of the country. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic presents many concerns, particularly effective clinical and public health management, primarily on novel viruses. These issues can only be addressed using science and technology, specifically through research and development. Thus, DOST finds a solution to this global concern by establishing a virology and vaccine research institute with the primary goal of developing diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics. The objectives of the VIP are to serve as a premier research and development institute in the field of virology, encompassing all areas in viruses and viral diseases in humans, plants, and animals act as a venue for scientists both here and abroad to work collaboratively to study viruses of agricultural, industrial, clinical, and environmental importance. And the third, establish strategic partnership with the world's leading scientists, virology centers, and institutes, and conduct innovative and pioneering research that will advance the frontiers of virology in the country. To institutionalize the VIP, we get the support from our lawmakers, both in Congress and Senate, by passing the bill regarding the establishment of VIP. While we are still waiting for the VIP bill to be enacted into law, the DOST has initiated several R&D projects implemented by ITDI, St. Luke's Medical Center, and Research Institute for Tropical Medicine. So these projects are being implemented in partnership with several local and international researchers and institutions. With these initial projects, we hope to build the capacity of the VIP and help resolve some of the pressing issues in the country brought about by viruses. Part of the project's activities is engaging the expertise of the Balik scientists to help us accomplish these initiatives. We have seven Balik scientists, two from the United Kingdom, four from the United States, and one from Australia. Among the activities of the Balik scientists is the conduct of seminars lectures and forums. So this July and August, the Balik scientists will talk about biosafety, biosecurity, and ethics. As an initial offering of the VIP webinar series today and tomorrow, Dr. Mayra Smiley will discuss bioethics on the use of animals for research, proper animal handling. With this, I welcome all the participants in the webinar series. I am delighted to have you among us in this activity. Allow me to express my gratitude to Dr. Osmilio for accepting the BSP engagement and helping IPDI in the VIP program. My special thanks to the VIP team of IPDI, ESD, and UNISP for organizing this event, the BSP Secretariat of PCHRD and PICAR, our ever supportive Secretary for Panacopy, Dila Peña, Under Secretary Rowena Cristina Guevara, Director Montoya, and Director Ibora. This webinar is only the start of our country's pandemic readiness. I hope the participants enjoy this webinar series and learn a lot. I also look forward to seeing you working at the VIP facility once established at the New Park City in Capastella. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Briones, for that warm welcome to our esteemed speaker and to our guests alike. But before we proceed to the meat of our session this afternoon, let me first introduce our speaker. She is a doctor of veterinary medicine from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. After graduating with the highest distinction, she then pursued her master's and doctorate degrees in molecular medical science at Chonam National University in South Korea. As a master's and PhD student, her research interests involved around, revolved around important viruses of global health concern, particularly the cause of gastroenteritis in both domestic and livestock animals. Following the receipt of her degrees up to the present, she has been working as a postdoctoral fellow in Professor Ian Goodfellow's laboratory in the Department of Virology at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. She is currently developing experimental systems and investigating host virus interactions of human norovirus and SARS-CoV-2. She has been directly guiding PhD students, visiting scholars, laboratory technicians, and collaborating scientists. Her mentorship and collaborations have led to the publication of peer-reviewed papers and several manuscripts. Today, she has published over 40 articles in international leading journals, including Science, Nature Microbiology, eLife, and PLOS Pathogen. Finally, she has volunteered to work as a part of the coronavirus genomics team at Cambridge, who are playing an important role in the UK national response for COVID-19. Furthermore, she has been also a part of the SARS-CoV-2 collaborative projects that involves the establishment of serological tools and small interfering RNA inactivation assays. It is my pleasure to welcome and to introduce a pride of our country, our very own DOSD Balik scientist, Dr. Myra Diosmilio, to talk about bioethics and the use of animals for research. A virtual round of applause for Dr. Osmilio, everyone. Good afternoon, ma'am. Um, I'm not sure if you can see me. Yes, and I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Uh, have you opened your camera, ma'am? Yes, we can see you. Good morning. Good Hello. afternoon. Po. Yes, ma'am. Um, magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat at magandang umaga uh, mula dito sa Inglaterra. Um, I will have to share my screen. Okay. okay, can you see my screen clearly as well? Yes, ma'am. Very right. clear, Paul. So, um, I'm really very happy and honored to be part of the Balik Scientist Program, as well as to be hosted by the ITDI. Um, let me just... Okay. Because it's uh, distracting me. Okay, magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat at muli ay magandang umaga mula sa Inglaterra. My name is Myra Rosmilio and I currently work in the Division of Virology, Department of Pathology at the University of Cambridge. And as part of the Balik Scientist Program and the establishment of the Philippine Virology Institute, I will be giving a series of lectures along with the other Balik Scientists program. Today, um, my topic is on bioethics and animal use in program for research, teaching and testing. And I'm aware that I am actually assigned to do uh, proper animal handling and I have intentionally separated that to you in the second day, okay? Okay, so my journey in science 
actually started from the humble town of Rosario in Batangas. And I have always been fascinated in science. And now I am at the point of my career where I think I'm more confident to share my knowledge and experiences. Over the years, as our moderator has said, I have been working on enteric viruses, both in humans and in animals. At Cambridge, we have been uh, trying to study human norovirus, which is one of the uh, main causes of diarrhea in children worldwide. We have been here, as you can see, with our uh, organoid, human intestinal organoid models, which we use to uh, culture human noroviruses. But maybe similar to many of you, because of the pandemic, our projects, a lot of our projects have been halted and our words have been diverted into playing a very important role as part of the UK national response. So I've been part of the team working on COVID genomics and also in working on trying to understand the different variants of the human SARS-CoV-2. I must say that I am really very passionate in empowering women and also young individuals to do science. And that extends to my fellow Filipinos. And today I am genuinely honored to be speaking to all of you and I hope that I could sh share uh, important knowledge that can be helpful for the country or for your career as well. So let us begin. So the use of non-human animals for benefits of human and other, on, and, and other animals is a very contentious subject. And that is because around the world, there are diverse concerns on cultural and moral traditions. Some religions or various religions see different uh, status of animals. And there are also varying individual and cultural ethical values. All of these are contributing to the complexity of regulations. In most countries, regulation of animal research operates through local ethical committee or by statutory controls imposed by the local government. However, it is the best interest of everyone to plan and conduct animal experiments where we can achieve ethical, legally compliant, high quality animal care and use programs. Today, the aims of my lecture is to uh, familiarize you with the international regulatory bodies, to gain information and provisions for licensing of undertakings, and to understand the scientifically, technically, economically, and humanely appropriate care and use of laboratory animals. Um, you, might, you will agree with me that animal research has played a very vital role in nearly every medical breakthrough over the last decade. As we share 95% of our genes with mouse, it is just um, well accepted that mouse has become a very effective model for human body, trying to understand both physiological and pathophysiological processes. But thanks to animal research, because it has helped us develop modern vaccines, including those against polio, TB, meningitis, and recently human papillomavirus, which has been linked to cervical cancer. Because of animal use in researches, it has also led to the development of highly um, active retroviral therapies which 30 years ago, which has helped a lot in treating AIDS patients. 30 years ago, a, when you've got AIDS, you will just die. It's just a death sentence 30 years ago. And also because of animal research, the smallpox has been eradicated. 
So the focus of our lecture today is on animals used for biomedical activities, which includes investigations used in behavioral, physiological, pathological, toxicological, and therapeutic research. Also includes animals that has been, is being used for experimental surgery and surgical training as well as testing drugs and biological preparations. In the figure below, this is actually one of our work in South Korea, where we studied to investigate the effect of a stevia, which is an alternative to uh, sugar. And we tried to evaluate its antiviral effects on rotavirus in piglets. At that time, we had to obtain a notobiotic piglet or a germ-free piglet through a C-section and raise them in sterile isolators. The experiment worked well. As you can see in the line graph, over a period of time, there was a reduce in viral titers. And to the left or right, as you can see that at the bottom, this is a a typical lining of a rotavirus infective intestine, but during the course of the treatment, uh, the intestinal lining has regained back to its uh, normal histology. So the use of animals for research are regulated by national laws and agencies. In the US, there is an Animal Welfare Act and this is a federal law that ad address or addresses the standard of care animals receive at research facilities. Also, the USDA is a federal agency responsible for overseeing and inspecting laboratories that experiment on animals, as well as those institutes that bred and sell animals for, the, for laboratory use. The US Public Health uh, Service, however, are in charge of assuring compliance to the law. In the UK, on the other hand, the guidance for animal testing and research has been legislated by the UK Home Office through the Animal Scientific Procedures Act 1986. And in Europe, the policies are regulated by uh, ESP. Um, for your information, the UK has the highest standards of laboratory animal welfare in the world. And so I think it is quite uh, important to be able to have an overview of uh, those practices as well. In the Philippines, the rules and regulations are stipulated as an administrative order number 40, or it is called the Animal Welfare Act of 1998. We have the Philippine Association for Laboratory Animals Science, who are actively promoting animal welfare and corresponding uh, to implementation of rules and regulations on the conduct of scientific procedures using quality laboratory animals. And any entity or private institutions who would like to um, use animals for research, they have to have an authorization through the Bureau of Animal Industry. Additionally, there are private regulatory bodies or organizations. For instance, the Council for International Organizations for Medical Sciences issues international guidelines for application of principles in various key areas. The American Association for Assessment and Accreditation of Laboratory Animal Care assesses and certifies animal ethics and care in science programs. And the last one you might um, many of you might be familiar, is the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, which is IACU, which reviews and approves protocols involving animals and ensures compliance. So this organization set international standards based on published data, scientific principles, 
expert opinion and experiences with methods and practices that have been proven to be consistent in attaining high quality research and humane animal care and use. To be able to conduct research using animal assessment, accreditations, or certifications are necessary. And this may include International Organization for Standardization, which is an ISO certification, the AAA LAC International Accreditation, and a bunch of local and national certification. Here in the UK, and there might be a, a quite similar system around the world where establishment of license to oversee welfare and animal care follows a licensing system. So the three level licensing system is composed of personal license, a product li project license and establishment license. A personal license is carried out by, by researchers like me. And these are, this gives uh, authority for scientists to apply the regulated procedures to specified animals. Project license, however, is obtained mainly by principal investigators. And this sets regulated procedures that need to be carried out and they must be auth authorized. But it is important to note that they have to be on a, with specific descriptions at a specified place. Everything has to be strict and specific. Lastly, the establishment license as is obtained for the place at which the regulated procedures will be carried out. And this includes an individual or a pharmaceutical company, the university and a research institute. Those who breed and supply uh, animals that will be used on for research have to have an establishment license as well. So the establishment uh, establishment or the place where regulated procedures are done have to have um, named persons and who would be responsible for specific duties. Namely, there are the veterinary surgeons who are a task on advising the health, welfare, and treatment of animals, the animal care and welfare officer who ensures that those uh, who oversees the welfare and care of animals, uh, people who are in charge of training, and they have to ensure that uh, those who obtain personal license are well trained they're educated and they're well supervised and they are competent to do their work properly. Also, we have the uh, information officers which who are uh, dealing with all the information and species description related to the animals in the facility. So what is an Animal Welfare Act? Uh, in some countries, it's also called Animal Scientific Procedures uh, Act. We have our own uh, Animal Welfare Act, the U.S. have it. But this uh, act regulates the procedures that are carried out on protected animal for scientific and educational purposes that may cause pain, suffering, distress, or lasting harm. This act also regulates the breeding and supply of certain species of animals for use in regulated procedures and for the scientific use of their organs and tissues. And lastly, it also regulates the appropriate methods that is used to kill protected animals. And what are protected animals? So protected animals by definition are living vertebrates. Recently, uh, the UK government have revised uh, their procedure, the, this definition to include invertebrates, um, such as, I think it's butterflies. 
but these are living vertebrates other than a man and any living cephalopod. Cephalopods includes the octopus and squid. So vertebrates are animals under self phylum vertebra or vertebrata of the phylum chordata. The animal is living or is defined living as long uh, as there is circulation and it's dead when the circulation stops permanently and the brain is destroyed. So other ver vertebrates in its fetal larval environmental form are also defined protected at a certain stage of their development. For example, in the case of mammals, birds and reptiles, they are uh, categorized as protected animal when they are at the two thirds gestation or incubation period. For fish and amphibian, they are protected when they are at the stage where they are capable of independent feeding. And the cephalopods are protected where when they're at the point when they are hatched. So before you plan or perform regulated procedures in fetal, larval, or embryonic forms, you should have a thorough knowledge of the gestation and incubation periods of the animals that you are using. It is very important. So regulated procedures are procedures that are applied to protected animal for a qualifying purpose. And qualifying purpose applies to uh, experimental, scientific, and educational purposes, which may have caused the effect of which may have the effect of causing the animal a level of pain, suffering, distress, or lasting harm. Regulated procedures may be acts of commission which is about dosing or sampling, deliberate emission, which uh, entails withholding food or water or removing organs, blood, tissues, or humane killing, or acts of permission where there is natural breeding of animals with harmful genetic defects or inclusion of modified genes for, of, for protected animals. Uh, the non-regulated procedures are a non-experimental clinical veterinary and agricultural practices, which are mainly clinical investigation and management for health and welfare of animals. Also, the veterinary clinical trials, which are usually carried out for marketing authorization. And some procedures that mainly require uh, or the main, where the main purpose is just to identify a specific individual. And this includes ringing, tagging, marking, microchipping, and earmarking. So the framework of humane animal research is the three R's. I think you can forget a lot, almost everything that I have said today, except for the three R, okay? Um, 3R is important because it promotes a high quality science. Because when you are trying to align your work through a 3R, this encourages scientists to scrutinize the model of selection and the use of the latest science and technology. It also increases efficiency and standards of the use and care of animals. Because the use of animal um, stimulates a lot of ethical issues. The use of 3Rs help to reconcile the ethical issues. Right now, many funding, international funding bodies and research institutes requires or includes 3Rs in their policies. So uh, following 3Rs also satisfies the national and international regulations and regulatory requirements. And again, it addressed societal concerns about the use of animals in research. So replacement. Replacement is basically methods for which you avoid or replace the use of animals. For several years in the past, um, 
I think scientists have been always trying to understand important scientific questions, including those related to human health using animal models. I have used animal models myself, and you would agree with me that using animal models can be very costly and time consuming. And sometimes, depending on your research question, it may present scientific limitations, which eventually can be poorly relevant to human biology. Um, I will uh, discuss about trying to implement uh, three R's in your work later on. Reduction. Reduction is the use of methods which minimize the number of animals used per, per experiment. So when it's impossible to not use animals, it is very vital that you minimize the number of animals. However, you have to design your experiment in such a way that it will not affect your result. It is equally important to get the satisfactory result with the right number of animals, but sometimes there's a way to minimize it. Refinement. So refinement are methods which minimize animal suffering and improve welfare. This applies to all aspects of animal use, from their housing, husbandry, to scientific procedures. And examples of refinement are housing that allows express expression of species-specific behavior, using appropriate anesthesia, or analgesia to minimize pain and training animals to cooperate with procedures to minimize distress. Hello. Cementing replacement. All right. Implementing replacement. So I've said a lot earlier that if there is a way where you can prevent the use in animal, you should do so. And recently there are a lot of uh, advances in science and technology where uh, experimental models have been quite diverse and will allow you to use alternative animal models. And how do you do this? You literally try to investigate alternatives to animal models by uh, simply performing literature searches. Um, I have just read that there are a lot of, um, I have just read that there's a sim simulation analysis that you can do and simulations allows you to check a thousand different ways and sort of minim can minimize animal use by half. So there are actually two types of replacement. One is a full replacement where you totally do not use animals and um, instead you can use cell, cell culture. However, there is also a partial replacement where instead of using animals, you can switch to lower organisms such as Drosophila, nematode worms or social amoeba. Implementing reduction. So when planning an experiment, you have to ask yourself whether the experimental design and its statistical analysis is robust. There is no such fixed number of the number of animal for every, I mean, for every experiment. There is a, a statistical, uh, an appropriate statistical way to do it to in such a way that will make your experimental setup valid. I suggest that you have to consult a statistician or you use an experimental design assistance which tailors um, according to your experimental design. And what this mathematical calculation does is it sort of calculate the uh, expected percentage or expected output versus the sample output and a lot of other factors. 
um, implementing refinement. So when planning and conducting an experiment, you have to ask yourself whether by doing such regulated procedure, are you able or what are the ways where you can minimize the pain, suffering and distress? Also, um, you have to ask yourself whether the chosen models and then point are the most humane way. And lastly, if there are ways that you can improve housing and husbandry of animals, and then I think it is best to try it. Uh, in the photo are just the pictures of how uh, scientists use tunnel to collect mice to transfer from one area to another, instead of picking them up in tail, which causes a lot of distress. Next. It's a void surplus of animals. So this is particularly important in uh, breeding animals as well. And the number of animals should be reduced to a minimum consistent with achieving scientific objectives of the study. And it is important that there are biological effects that can be missed with few animals. Um, having overproduction of animals in the lab or in an establishment is also uh, not adhering to animal welfare. However, there are following approaches where you can minimize surplus animals. First is to plan your projects carefully with sufficient time and build into breed animals for, for specific requirements. To apply proper experimental and statistical designs in advance to accurately predict the minimal number of animals that you need. To justify rigid requirements for particular characteristics in terms of sex, weight, age, and also you can collaborate with other users of the establishment in the establishment so everyone can share with the animal, with the animals. In case of really uh, uncontrolled overproduction, it would be if it is possible, it would be good if you can cryopreserve the strains. And so as a record keeping, it is important to do uh, records of surplus animals and a regular review for the reasons why. Uh, why there are surplus animals. So in an establishment, it is important that protected animals have appropriate care and accommodation. I have told you a while ago that there are important named person with different responsibilities who sort of checks and comply with the animal welfare. So the animal care and accommodation is mainly a responsibility of the establishment holder. And they have to ensure that protected animals have uh, proper environment, housing, freedom of movement, food, water, social structure. That all installations of the building are of approved um, specifications. There are conditions for transporting, um, movements, restrictions of movements is minimized. And there is a regular check of the health and well being of animals, particularly by a competent person. Additionally, um, in an in establishment, there is a way that you can avoid a pain, suffering, and distress, and lasting harm. And if it is discovered, it is important that it's eliminated as quickly as possible. There should be quarantine and acclimatization facilities, adequate security measures, mainly to prevent animals from escaping, but also to avoid unauthorized intrusions. There should be adequate fire precautions and appropriate measures to deal with other disasters, such as flood and power cut and defined rooms and other areas. 
Severity category for a protocol. So when a PI submits a, a project license or would like to obtain a project license before it is granted, a series of procedures in this, each protocol is classified according to severity. And the severity is classified as mild, moderate, severe, and non-recovery. It is mild when the animal likely experienced short-term mild pain, suffering, or distress with no significant impairment of the well-being. It becomes moderate when it can cause moderate impairment and severe when it has severe impairment. And non-recovery when um, the procedure was performed entirely under general anesthesia from which an animal should not recover consciousness. Uh, defining severities of the procedure. So the severity of a procedure is evaluated according alongside with its benefits. So whenever you're working, it, um, officers always try to understand the harm, the harmful, and harm and benefit, and try to analyze the harm and benefits. And there are several considerations in defining severity of procedures. And that includes type of manipulation, handling, nature of pain, suffering, intensity and duration, frequency and the number of techniques being used in each animal, cumulative suffering if it's a serious number of protocols, expected adverse effects, um, if there are uh, animals, if the animals are prevented from behaving naturally by restrictions in housing, husbandry, and standard care, if their methods to reduce or eliminate pain, suffering, and distress, and also if, with the humane endpoints and how they are applied. As a scientist, it is important that you should not allow the animal's condition to approach the severity limits specified in the protocol, except where absolutely necessary. So the use and reuse of protected animals. Actually, after you use a protected animal for a particular experiment, it is possible to reuse that animal as long as as long as the general well-being of the animal is in, in, at the severity level of non-recovery, mild, and moderate. Also, if the veterinary surgeon has confirmed or has been has uh, the information of the lifetime experience of the animals and can confirm that the animal's well-being uh, is at, a, at a, a good state. Thirdly, if the animal has undergone a series of uh, procedures, it is important that the actual severity of one, uh, not more than one of the procedures should have been classified as severe. Uh, that usually as an endpoint of an experiment is inevitable. However, if there are ways to avoid it, we should avoid it. Um, we have to achieve scientific aims of the procedure with measures should be taken to ensure that there are few deaths as possible. And if ever it has to be employed, there should be reduced duration and intensity of suffering. More importantly, it is important that uh, scientists develop an expertise in predicting clinical signs that indicate death. Humane killing of protected animals follow a specific protocol. Here we call it a schedule one protocol where, there is, where uh, pain, is, pain, suffering and distress is minimized. And According to type of animal, there is appropriate killing method. 
who are allowed to do the killing or the humane killing, they should be well-trained. They should be educated, well-trained, and registered as competent to kill. And here, I have to get my personal license to, author, to get the authorization to be able to kill a protected animal. And lastly, the end of the procedure. So in the end of the procedure, there are several routes where an animal could go. Um, when the animal is suffering and likely to suffer due to adverse effect, then the, it has to be, uh, there are provisions for it. However, if the health of the animal uh, has been proven to be good uh, or there are prior consent in the project license for release and rehoming, then that would be possible as well. It is important to note that rehoming should not pose any danger to public health. So with that, I would like to summarize the, what I have um, shared today is about having, uh, I would like to uh, stress that good science and good animal welfare go hand in hand. Because we want to be able to compete internationally. We want to receive international funding such as in NIH or in Wellcome Trust in the UK. We should satisfy national and international regulations and regulatory requirements. And also we should be able to address ethical and social concerns. So with that, I would like to close my presentation and I'm very grateful for all of you for attending this and thankful for listening to my lecture. I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hosmilio, for your presentation on bioethics and the use of animals in research. So I'm sure that our participants are now looking forward to uh, ask their questions for the first part of our session this afternoon. So just let me just remind everyone that this is just the first part. This is our first day. Tomorrow, we will uh, continue with our second session. So we expect your participation uh, tomorrow as well because we will... Uh, show the evaluation form and you have to answer that before you can secure a certificate. So again, thank you po, Dr. Myra, sa inyong presentation. We are now accepting questions as our esteemed speaker said. So um, let me just check yung pong mga taga uh, collect ng ating questions sa different, different platforms because we are live via Facebook, Zoom, and YouTube. Okay, meron na po tayong buena mano, Dr. Myra. So the question is, uh, are there special regulations for humanized animal models such as mice, which are artificially implanted with immune cells and organs from humans? This is a question from Lindley Susi via Zoom. Well, I've actually read that uh, using animals that contain human material is quite restricted. So I think it is... There are regulations, but it is restricted. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Any more questions from the floor? Zoom participants, Facebook participants, and Jen Papu Bakayo. Maybe they're still um, digesting. Lahat po ng mga natutunan nila this afternoon. Indeed, this session is uh, very special because we have our very own DOSC Balik Scientist para po i-discuss ang kanyang mga, um, para po i-discuss ang kanyang expertise about bioethics on human animals. So, any more questions? So, so far, we are 102 in Facebook Live and we have 321 participants here sa Facebook. So Zoom pala, I mean. Okay. But I might just add, so okay, there, no? are, there are listed restrictions to animal research, and that includes the animal with the human material, but also includes the use of endangered animals, the use of domestic animals, the use of primates as well. So there are rules regarding that, but I think 
um, if there are ways where you can prevent using them, that is uh, more recommended. They are only used when there is no other option. Okay. Okay, we have another question here via Zoom as well. Uh, the question is from um, Zoom. The question is, in the absence of a trained professional for sacrificing the test animals, are the experimenters or researcher students allowed to perform this, the sacrifice themselves? And that's a tricky question for me, yeah. to be honest, because I think we have local rules for me, as a researcher in the UK, even if I am a veterinarian and I can prove that I can do that, I can do a necropsy for animals, it is not possible for me to do that by myself without my personal uh, license. And that personal license is recognized in every university in the UK as well as in, the, in Europe. I think in, I'm not sure in, uh, in the Philippines, but I think moving forward, if we are to do experiments or projects in collaboration with foreign scientists, we will have to do similar uh, policies. So the answer should be no. Okay, no. <laughs> Safety first. Okay, we have another question here from Robinson Luzon via Zoom. Do we have standards intended for secondary education in animal handling here in the Philippines? Is there limitations for high school students for animal handling? Um, so that's also one of the restrictions of uh, the Animal Welfare Act. So that... Uh, the education and training is limited to the professional scientists, okay? This does not include high school students. I think handling for high school students should be very limited to things that should not uh, primarily not harm the young students. But also, I don't think they are capable enough to be able to understand or control behavior of animals. If it's just uh, like pet animals, I think that is all right. But if we're talking about animals okay. that is important for research, I think that should be restricted. Okay, that was uh, noted. Well noted, ma'am. We have another question from Joel Sabiliano Jr. via Zoom as well. What is meant by rehoming? How can animals be rehomed not to pose danger in public health? Yeah, um, so there are experiments such as dosing or sampling, which may not involve uh, pathogens or dangerous pathogens. I think that would include, include rehoming. However, if the experiment had involved genetic modification or introduction of uh, pathogens, that are listed to be harmful for humans and animals, then they should not be rehomed. I think, yeah, I have personally have not uh, read a specific list of the criteria for rehoming, but I would assume so. Um, most of the experiments that I have done in the past have death as an endpoint. Okay, well, thank you, ma'am. So, uh... We have another question from uh, Roland Sabordo via Zoom as well. Question is, I would like to clarify, given I have poor internet connection, it's okay. Uh, I would like to ask, what type of laboratory experiments on animals are possible to be considered ethical? What type of laboratory on animals? type of laboratory experiments on animals are possible uh, to be considered ethical? I mean, it, is, it is a little bit of personal, I think it's a little bit of a personal issue. Um, most of the uh, laboratory experiments that we do, so one of the things that I have said is, uh, or one of the things that is being looked at when a project license is being obtained is to analyze a harm and benefit, okay? So um, there will always be ethical issues for the use of animals in research. 
However, if there are more benefits uh, compared to the harm, harmful effects that an experiment can, uh, a harmful effect that will lead to uh, an experimental animal, then I think is considered as an ethical uh, experiment. So the reason why we're trying to align all our procedures with uh, refinement, replacement, and reduction is to be able to compromise to the ethical issues that are, are being raised by the public. I'm sorry, maybe it's not very clear, but I think, yeah, that is a very hard point. But what I can just say is it has to be a way with harm and benefit analysis, and that's what they do. And also that's one reason why we have to align our experiment with the three R's is to allow, uh, even if there is an, an, maybe an ethical issue, then there's still a lot. Okay, thank or you for maybe, that. Um, I'm, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry for that. And maybe, um, and ethical experiments are, so when an experiment is well planned and there is a minimal number of animals that is used, then although the end of the experiment may cause harm or it may uh, cause some ethical issues, um, it, it can still be overcome. I'm sorry for that. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Rosminia. So I guess uh, from what you answered, as long as the benefits outweigh the consequences, and of course, uh, as we learned from the lecture, we should um, think about the three R's before employing uh, that uh, yeah. animals in our research. Yes. <laughs> okay, we have another question uh, from Clarence Le Bautista via Zoom. Uh, the question is, would you say organ on a chip model be better alternative than using animal models. What are the advantages and disadvantages between the two? Yeah, I mean, the chip model itself, I have myself used a sort of a similar um, system to chip model where a biopsy is taken from intestinal uh, patient, human patients. So a chip model just allows you to have a similar system, an organ system that you can bring in the lab and manipulate without conducting that experiment in a real animal. So with the presence of chip models and organoid system, it just gives an alternative way to avoid using animals and yeah, avoid conducting experiments to animals. One of the drawbacks is it's definitely very difficult. It's not straightforward, but equally, I don't think it is very straightforward using animals as well. Um, also, because this is a, a new technology, it is not yet well established. So if you're trying to answer questions, you have to be able to understand the whole system itself as well and expect like errors in the system. It is, it is not perfect. Thank you for that uh, answer, Dr. Rosmilio. So um, there is another question here. Um, Dr. Rosmilio mentioned the composition of a committee for an institutional license. Is it universal or is it prescribed in RA 8485 or the Philippine Animal Welfare Act? So I have read the Animal Welfare Act and it has not been uh, listed there. And that is fine because that is our local rules. However, if, if there are institutions or particularly institutions outside of the Philippines that would require that as part of their policy, then we might have to do that. Okay. 
Thank you for that. Uh, we have another question here, an interesting question from Fidel Malbas via Zoom. How do we harmonize the decision of a statistician and a biostatistician with regards to the number of animals being used in research? Yeah, so that was also a question to myself when I was trying to prepare for this presentation. However, I have seen a paper which defines several factors in an experiment. So it sort of calculates for you the number of animals and for every number of animals, the growth or the significance or the expected effects that you can get. For example, um, in our lab, we are allowed to use uh, six animals or mice per group to study norovirus. And that has been calculated to see uh, a significance in a differences with a control and experimental result. Um, I'm not a statistician myself, so I cannot uh, clearly explain this, but there is a way to get the minimum number of animals with while getting the best results for your experiment as well. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Osmilio. So uh, for purposes of time... Thank you as well for that. So. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Osmilio. Um, for purposes of time management, we are down to our last question for this session. So wag pong malungkot yung mga hindi namin nakuhang questions for this afternoon because we will still have our second day tomorrow. So just uh, we took note of your questions via Zoom. Uh, so we will ask them tomorrow po sa ating uh, second session. So let me just ask this final question from Ms. Athena Chavez via Zoom. The question is, after the experiments involving genetic modifications or injections with pathogens, can the, can the test animals be reused for other experiments? How do we ethically dispose test animals? Yes, um, I will discuss about disposal of animals and further details of killing animals tomorrow as well as animal care. Um, Basically, all of the pathogens that we study are mainly um, virulent. But in the, here, I know there are a list of non-pathogenic uh, viruses and pathogenic viruses. So based on that, like, uh, for example, we, in, a, in our establishment, we have uh, astroviruses that are just present in every um, in every mice in the facility. And it's still being, because uh, it is endemic and it's not causing any symptomatic effect to the animal, the mice are fairly healthy, then it's still used as a experimental animal for studying uh, mouse norovirus. I think the uh, exact answer for that is it will depend on every pathogen However, if you're trying to give a pathogen, depending on the dose, depending on the effects and the symptoms effect on the animal, that will determine whether it, an animal can be reusable for another experiment. All right. So that is our last question for this session. Again, I would like to thank uh, especially our esteemed speaker for joining us and for uh, giving her insights about our topic this afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rosmilio. Uh, virtual round of applause naman po para sa ating balik scientists sa UK. Again ma'am, magandang umaga po sa inyo. And of course, reminder lamang po sa ating participants, we still have our second session for tomorrow. So you have to be present in order to answer our evaluation form. Same time, 2.30 uh, p.m. And then we will proceed with... Uh, the presentation part two directly and we uh, and probably we will still have more time for the Q&A. So again, lahat po ng mga nagtanong na hindi po natin itanong this afternoon, bukas po natin yan babalikan. So again, thank you very much. Uh, this has been Meg Atienza and I hope, uh, I wish you a good rest of the day and to Miss Myra again, thank you very much po Doc and good morning po sa inyo sa UK. Thank you so much and have a nice day. Yes, well, see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.
Kilaot na ang manok, hudyat na ng pagpasok. Paglilingkod na walang kapalit sa bayan ng aming hati. Tara na, kaibigan, huwag kang magpaiwan. Gamitin ang dunong bansa'y susulo. Mahirap man ay kakayanin Sa pinagsamang lakas at galing Tagumpay ay mararating Tara na kaibigan Huwag kang magpaiwan Gamitin ang dunong bansa ay susuro At ingabutin ang pangarap iwan Sa pamamagitan na Tingabutin ang pangarap iwan Sa pamamagitan na